Welcome to my talk, The Water Runs Through It. The it is a Spokane Aquifer, or its current formal name, the Spokane Valley Rathrum Prairie Aquifer, thus giving credit due to its actual location in two states. My name is Michael Hamilton, and this presentation is part of my participation as a board member of the Spokane Cheney chapter of the Ice Age One Institute. My career experiences as a field geologist with the U.S. Department of the Interior and Washington State Department of Natural Resources exposed me to the many aspects of Western geology. My DNR work in particular involved the geologic remapping of Eastern Washington that included the many glacial flood features that were left behind. And this experience is incorporated into this talk. The great glacial outburst floods of the last ice age are an important part of the aquifer story. For simplicity, I'll use the title, the Spokane Aquifer, or just the aquifer. The subtitle, bearing the word appreciation, refers to one of the goals of this talk, which is to give some insight into both the historic story of the aquifer's discovery and development, and to show the stack of special geologic events that form this fabulous natural resource. Hopefully, this will generate an appreciation that will result in more participation and the wise use and protection of this valuable resource. We use our aquifer every day in many ways without thinking much of the advantages of having this abundant and clean water source. So let's get started with an overview of the role in our lives of this naturally occurring two hydrogens, one oxygen combination that we call water. Earth. Our home is a special planet in many respects. Our blue ball can be described appropriately as a water planet. If it were not for the dynamic geologic forces that raise continents and sink ocean bottoms, the planet appearance from space would be a, a ball of water. Not only is water abundant, but it can be found in its three forms, liquid, solid, and a gas. Water is colorless, tasteless, odorless, calorie-free, and absolutely essential for all life. Other planets and moons in our solar system may have or have had some water. Current exploration on Mars indicates there was abundant surface water much earlier in the planet's history, but changing Martian conditions were unable to retain the water. Exploration interests on Mars centers on the realization that water can mean life and evidence of past life may still remain defined. Here are some statistics on water's roles. About 71% of the Earth's surface is water covered. And in that coverage, 10.5% is ice. Ocean, lakes, and rivers total about 3,496 billion billion gallons of water with only 3% of that useful fresh water. While water is abundant, fresh water is not. And global climate changes combined with demand increases are separating populations into the haves and have nots as far as access to clean and plentiful water resource. Billions of people are facing a thirsty future. With water usage doubling, Every 20 years, many communities that were once fairly stable with water needs are now pushing the limits of the resource and wondering what is next. On a more personal note, <clears throat> your own body is on the average 65% water. National Academy of Science recommends drinking about uh, nine cups of water per day for women and 15 cups per day for men. So bottoms up. Good way to start the aquifer story is to turn on the tap and have a drink. Nothing more thirst crunching than a cool glass of water. Where does this come from? Where has it been before it fills your glass fresh out of the faucet? Your faucet is just the last stop from a long journey from the rain or snow to your glass. So let's take a journey upstream 
and see where it takes us. First, through the water pipes in your home on the upper left, and then into the city water pipes for the next segment of the journey to the source. There will be a brief stop at your water meter to generate your monthly utility bill. In Spokane, there's about 1,100 miles of underground municipal water conduits, often buried under streets that lead us to the local water tank. These protected reservoirs hold a stockpile of clean water to accommodate varying needs of usage and to maintain a suitable water pressure and outlets. From the tanks, larger pipes lead back to the pumping stations that are needed to raise and fill them. Pumping stations are connected to the massive thousand horsepower pumps that raise water from the aquifer at 180 million gallons per day. Spokane is but one of the 20 water purveyors that tap the aquifer for the daily needs of many. At last, we are arriving at the centerpiece of this talk, the Spokane Aquifer. This picture shows the aquifer gravel and the exposed groundwater table and a gravel pit in the Spokane Valley that was dug into the aquifer. Notice the horizontal lines in the gravel slope that are wave cuts that document the various levels of the water table at this location. So let's start some formal introductions. The Spokane Aquifer is, from the Glossary of Geology, a body of rock that is sufficiently permeable to conduct groundwater and to yield economically sufficient quantities to wells and springs. It should be noted that an aquifer is not the groundwater, but the rock that holds and transports the groundwater. It is an unconfined aquifer that is not sealed from the surface by an impermeable rock layer that would pressurize the water layer. An unconfined aquifer has an upper water surface or water table that is at atmospheric pressure and freely communicates with surface water to recharge. It should be noted that unconfined aquifers are more susceptible to pollution. The aquifer is also labeled a sole source aquifer, an important designation given by the US Environmental Protection Agency, better known as the EPA. This designation means the aquifer supplies at least 50% of the drinking water for its surface area, and there is no reasonable available alternative drinking water source should the aquifer become contaminated. There has been so much written on the Spokane aquifer, it's hard to find the right place to start. Over the years, the obvious importance of our water supply has generated piles of ge geologic and hydrologic data and many excellent reports, publications, and displays. My approach is to emphasize an appreciation more than just a scientific education by first telling the story of discovery and development, then showing the succession and combinations of special geologic events that assemble the aquifer as we see it today. The discovery of the Spokane Aquifer dates back to the late 1800s, when the need for additional clean water expanded with urban growth in the Spokane area. With the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad, new mining districts, agriculture, and commercial commerce associated with the settlement of the West demands for water grew fast. The story starts as early as 1884, when the city of Spokane drew its water from for, for the more populous parts of the village from the river for a pumping plant on the island above the falls. Spokane was growing rapidly and two effects were immediate. The need for more water and the pollution of the river. Solution, brine fresher water upstream and build a dam with a, with a reservoir and a large pumping plant. As shown here in 1894, a wood cribbed dam was constructed at an upriver site. Pumps move the reservoir water into the city outlets. 
notice the dam is leaking a bit already. <clears throat> Along with the urban growth came the need for farms and orchards to feed the increasing populations. The Spokane Valley was filling up with farmers that needed water and our dry climate for agriculture. At first, irrigation canals diverted river water to gravity feed the farms, but more was needed. Some of these canals cut into the valley walls can still be found despite long periods of disuse. The picture on the upper left shows pines looking south. It sure looks a bit different from present day scenes uh, uh, with farms everywhere. Around 1900, a farmer named Albert Kelly dug a well on his property at 4123 East Sprague. They need additional water for his gardens. This photo shows the current site, uh, current use of this site. The well was hand dug about 50 feet deep. No doubt his neighbors were curious about what Albert was up to and probably visited to lend their opinion on the value of such hard work. Maybe to his surprise, the water at the bottom was clear and abundant and showed no sign of depletion even when an electric pump was applied. The aquifer had been tapped. Current location of Kelly's well has been covered with asphalt, common for our times. So an artistic reconstruction of the site around 1900 may be of some value here. As with many things in American history, good ideas spread very fast. By 1908, we see in this picture a wellhead by Modern Electric and Opportunity pumping 3,000 gallons per hour into an irrigation canal. The early electrification of uh, the area allowed for bigger pumps that upscaled water extraction. Notice how empty the valley looked in 1908. The picture here includes the expected mix of workers and bosses. Also notice the one horsepower vehicle that got them to the well site. Spokane Valley's increased population combined with Coeur d'Alene's urban growth, combined with agriculture upstream and combined with everyone thinking that the river was the perfect place to dump everything equals the inevitable pollution. In 1908, the Spokane Board of Health was compelled to condemn the river as a source of water for the city. An entirely different source would have to be sought and the upper river water plant would have to be abandoned. This was a water crisis, but the Spokane aquifer was to come to the rescue. As a footnote to the rescue theme, the aquifer does have an official superhero mascot, Aqueduct, defender of the aquifer, more Mr. Duck later. Please note Aqueduct on the right, channeling Smokey the Bear with a shovel. Then it was remembered that when digging foundations for the upriver plant in 1906, holes flooded with water that refused to lower even when seriously pumped. The experience, but skeptical engineers agreed to drill a set of test wells to confirm this water resource. For days, the pumps worked hard, but they lowered the water level not a whit. It's found that at the upriver plant site, the groundwater was shallow, about 30 feet, but much deeper to the east up the valley. 1907, well number one was dug at the upriver site and remains today as a historic building. Uh, visiting the waterworks and asking the attendant there, um, he'll let you into the building if you want to see the aquifer and the interior of the old well.
in the 40 foot deep or the 50, excuse me, in the 50 foot deep brick line well, water was found to be clear and without a fault, except maybe a little hard with minerals, but not at all like the river water. An interesting footnote, the white haze found at the bottom of your upturned glass that dried in the dishwasher is the precipitated mineral content of the aquifer water. Calcium carbonate and uh, silicon oxide, both white. The water was a consistent 48 degrees and maintained a water level above the adjacent river, both suggesting a separate source. By 1925, after additional studies, the faith in the huge aquifer as a dependable water source grew in the minds of the engineers and the city officials and new, uh, when the city officials and new wells were started. Here we can see the construction of two large production wells that are still used today. The upriver site remained convenient due to the shallow depth of the aquifer and the closeness to the city. In the background of this picture of the lower right, you can see the, the old pumping plant works. Check out the contemporary auto in the upper left. Over the years, many other events marks both the development and the scientific studies involving the Spokane Aquifer. Here are just a few of the most notable. Starting in the 1920s, J. Harlan Brett's research and published on the geologic model that was to play an important role in understanding the formation of the aquifer. The glacial outburst floods at the end of the last ice age will be discussed later. By 1936, Spokane's water supply was fully harnessed to the aquifer with the construction of a concrete dam and powerhouse at the upriver site. In 1940, Joseph Pardee of the U.S. Geological Survey researched the large amount of water that was backed up behind a glacial ice dam that provided the water power to make our aquifer. The 1974 World's Fair brought awareness of the environment and the importance of our water resources. After being partitioned by local citizens, the EPA designated the Spokane Aquifer as a sole source aquifer, the second in the nation to receive this designation. Now there were rules and laws to protect our water source. Spokane County in 1985 created aquifer protection areas to further establish local protection. And in 1997, Idaho followed suit. By 2013, Idaho and Washington, in recognition that the aquifer spans two states, provided coordination in the management efforts. The last story of this water odyssey is your next glass of this precious liquid. <laughs> Lastly, <clears throat> here is something that did not happen to the aquifer. In the 1920s, there was a debate between the gravity people that wanted to irrigate the central dry basin of Washington with water flowing downhill from the outlets of Lake Pend Oreille, and the pumping people that wanted to build a giant dam on the Columbia River and pump water up to a resource a reservoir for irrigation while also generating electricity. The gravity project would have robbed water from the, an aquifer recharge area not to mention a water canal through Spokane with Latel Valley dammed and full of water. The pumpers won since we needed the electricity and a very large work project for the Great Depression. So let's build a Spokane River from the bottom up. And for a, gel, for a geologist, that means to start at the beginning back in time. Cooking up this geologic dish can be better be understood by presenting it as a fixing dinner. While the scale is quite different, the process is similar. The recipe should be served at least, should serve at least one half a million people, but could also serve quite more if the care is taken not to spoil the dish in time. The recipe starts with the required ingredients. 
One large basin big enough to hold a large aquifer. Well weathered basin fill that can easily be removed to make room for later for aquifer materials. Tons and tons of sand and gravel will set these aside for later use. Vast amounts of water to pour rapidly into and scour out the basin. Uh, careful, this can alter the landscape. Even more water move set aside gravels into the basin and flush away all the fine sediments. Roughly stratified gravel and sand layers with high porosity, permeability, and transmissicity. Also, large number of bodies of water, such as lakes and recharge areas. Um, and lastly, several mountain chains behind recharge areas, recharge areas to catch water bearing weather and hold the snowpack. Serve up with the appropriate amounts of wells. Here are some more tips on preparation. You will be needing, let's see, prep time is about 50 million years, but most of the work will be done in the last 17,000 years. Uh, you will be needing uh, some stretch earth crush available at your local tectonic store, uh, years extensive weathering on sale at myasane.com. The global ice age, this requires some refrigeration. And lastly, one large ice dam uh, failure flaws are okay. Whoops. Step one, forming the basins to hold the aquifer is where we'll start. About 50 million years ago, geologists use the word about often, the Earth's crust in eastern Washington area started stretching and pulling apart. Uh, this is shown in uh, the inset map on the uh, right-hand side. Global plate tectonics are the cause, but the details of where the continents are drifting, breaking up, or crashing together is a whole different recipe. Slowly, the Spokane and Ratham Prairie Valleys formed, along with an impressive large north-south trench of the Rocky Mountains called the Purcell Trench. Drainage of water from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean exploited these rifts of fractured rock to form wide slots through the mountainous terrain. About 15 million years ago, the valleys that opened to the west and south were plugged by an eruption of lava shown in the map, insert upper left, that filled up the central parts of the state with thousands of feet of hot basalt, blocking drainage out of the mountains and turning the valleys into basin-filled lakes. Needless to say, this is all very complicated and the overprint of erosion over time completes the picture. Step two, and the recipe is the application of lots of time to erode out the valleys of the fractured materials left over from crustal stretching. Then amply fill these basins and valleys with more easily removable materials. The salt blockages, uh, to drainage result in large lakes forming in this area. The climate at this time in the Miocene period was hot and wet. Here's a picture of possible local view, possible local view with emphasis, however, on the wildlife. Cascade Mounds had yet to rise up to catch the Pacific wet storms before reaching our area. And that combined with a hot climate resulted in a lot of weathering, both chemical and physical. The picture insert, lower left, shows the clay pit at Micah, Washington, just southeast of Spokane. Bricks have been made here for over 100 years, all from a thick clay deposit from the Miocene weathering. Local lake bottoms, was, bottoms were filling up with silts and clays from the eroding hillsides of deep soil layers full of clay. A piece of the local Miocene lake bed bottom is featured here, lower right with a leaf fossil from the broadleaf forest that grew around the lakes. Valleys here were eventually covered over with thin flows of lava or basalt, but the underpinnings of soft lake bed bottoms 
designated des designated them for rapid erosion and removal. Moving right along to step three, we have to get busy making tons of sand and gravel. Here we'll be needing that we'll be needing later for the recipe. For this, will be necessary to fire up bad term a global ice age to provide moving massive the heavy thick ice sheets to grind up the Earth's surface and their accompanying meltwaters wash them with the resulting sands and gravels in the piles. Uh, abundant glacial till, uh, picture shown on the left, and glacial wash right, picture right below it, um, is the legacy of this process. As much as climate change is the current topic, there's a tradition in the Earth's historic record of shifts and global weather patterns. The graph here covers average temperatures throughout the latest era of time that started 65 million years ago. Temperatures on the vertical line and the timeline on the horizontal. Please note that time numbers are compressed on the early part of the era to better display the trend of changes since the Ice Age. Early time epochs were quite warm. A general cooling started about 4 million years ago, and the Ice Age started 2 million years ago. Four major glacial advances with interim warmer periods ended about 11,000 years ago. The right side of the graph estimates the future trend in global temperatures. Okay, welcome back, Miocene. First part of step four is accumulation of lots of water ready to pour. Here we'll get some help from the last ice age when a large continental ice sheet blocking drainage of water flowing out of the Rocky Mountains, the Pacific Ocean. Increasing meltwaters caused by the warming to the end of the ice age added to the backup. Large lakes were forming behind these ice dams. The largest was glacial Lake Missoula seen on the right side of this map. The red arrow points to where we will focus our attention to discuss in more detail the geologic event that made the Spokane Aquifer <clears throat> most unique. Of note, another large ice dam in the vicinity of Grand Coulee blocked the Columbia River drainage, resulting in a backup of Glacial Lake Columbia, which covered a Spokane area. We certainly have enough water now for this recipe, so that's time to, to get ready to pour. This map shows in more detail our area of interest. Spokane is in the lower left and the Idaho panel handle in the middle. The Cordillian ice sheet has reached its maximum advance to the north. One lobe has filled the Purcell Trench and has extended south over the Ponderay Basin, a deep valley probably excavated in a previous ice advance. Notice the position of the current Lake Ponderay as a blue area <clears throat> under the southern end of this ice lobe. Just to the east of the blue area is the ice blockage of water running out of uh, northwest Montana through the Clark Fork River. This ice plug to the glacial water bottle is what we'll need to remove for our recipe. Let's take a look in more detail how the stage was set by taking a cross section of the action area that is located uh, by the red line and the inset map in the upper right. Initially, the Ponderay Basin was covered by ice slope advancing from the ice sheet to the north. The Clark Fork uh, uh, is shown on the right-hand side. <clears throat> With additional lobe advances, our cross-section shows a thickening ice sheet with the right edge moving east and now blocking drainage uh, confined to the Clark Fork Valley. Continuing ice advancement 
and continuing ice sheet thickening is resulting in significant water uh, backup with Lake Missoula filling the valleys of northwestern Montana. Notice the depth of the lake to the east. The weight of this ice sheet combined with a tight hydro seal between the ice and the bedrock at the bottom of the Clark Fork Valley is holding back this growing lake. But that was about to change. Here, the situation is unstable. A deepening lake was resulting in a growing hydrostatic pressure on the ice dam. Erosion on the east side caused by warming at the end of the ice age combined with wave action in the lake was reducing the area of the tight hydro seal on the bedrock. Something got, has got to give. Here's another cross section through the ice dam, which displays the outburst flood event that was critical in the formation of the Spokane Aquifer. We're looking north, check out some of the numbers, over 5,000 feet of ice and over 2,000 feet of water in Lake Missoula. Hydrostatic pressures combined with the failing seal at the bottom of the ice lobe was resulting, uh, was, which was resting on loose sands and gravels in the Pond Array Basin left over from a previous glaciation resulted in a massive sub-ice eruption. The term Yakalops is used to describe such a flood event, an Icelandic term for similar but much smaller outburst floods from the sub from subglacial volcanic eruptions in Iceland. Water surging under the ice lobe flowed into the bottom of glacial Lake Columbia as a powerful density flow that dug out the soft lake bed bottoms in the Rathrum Prairie and the Spokane Valley, thus setting the scene for the next step. This very large outburst flood was thought to have occurred about 17,000 years ago. While the emptying of Lake Missoula, with the emptying of Lake Missoula, the remaining ice lobe would settle and reseal. A series of smaller floods occurred as the lake filled and emptied Till the ice was gone. Before we move on to the next step, here's an artist's rendition of the sub-ice sub eruption of Bayview, Idaho. The ice was probably thicker than the, art, than the artist's figure here. Step five, as Lake Missoula emptied fast under the ice dam. Much of the gravel and sand in the Ponderay Basin was excavated and rapidly moved downstream and to the Rathrum Prairie and then into the Spokane Valley, which was then the bottom of Lake Columbia. When the last flood happened and the ice sheet retreated to the north, <clears throat> Lake uh, Ponderay was left over a thousand feet deep as can be seen in the upper right insert. Impressive amounts of gravel were left in the Spokane Valley escape can be seen in this photograph of a quarry cut through the, the, what the flood left behind. This is the stuff that the Spokane Aquifer is made of. One very large flood about 17,000 years ago did most of the work, but numerous smaller floods also added to the rock pile. Step six. The high energy, fast moving floodwaters strip the finer sediments, size sediments component from the moving sediments, leaving or depositing clean and coarse gravels behind, make up the aquifer layers. Simple demonstration of how much water can be held in the spaces between pebbles is illustrated using a mason jar apparently full of gravel that still holds quite a bit of water. This is called the porosity. Also illustrated, illustrated is the ease with which water passes through clean, coarse gravel. This is referred to as permeability. The transmisticity is the application of both these factors to an aquifer with the addition of other factors such as continuity, size, or slope to describe an aquifer's cap 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 capacity to transmit water. 
The Spokane Aquifer rates, rates very high in all these categories, mainly due to the unique geologic event that cooked up this fine dish. The photo insert on the right, or right, is Waikiki Springs, discharging aquifer water into the Little Spokane River. Aquifer water velocities have been clocked as fast as 50 feet per day. The water does indeed run through it very well. Step seven, the dish is almost ready to be served. This map displays the area covered by the aquifer shown in blue, a whopping 370 square miles. Bonus effect of the giant flood filling up the Spokane Valley and Rathram Prairie with piles of sediments was the damming of the side valleys creating lakes as to act as natural recharge reservoirs. Notice in the Spokane Valley, there's no surface tributaries to the Spokane River since water draining into the valley simply seeps into the porous gravels. Those combined with the other two large lakes in the area, Lake Coeur d'Alene and Lake Pend Oreille, a large water recharge at the, head of the, at the headwaters of the aquifer is now in place. Notice the state line in the center of the map and Idaho's uh, and Idaho shares the aquifer's recharge area. Step eight, to top off this fabulous concoction, back up your aquifer recharge area with mountains, mountains high enough to catch the prevailing water bearing weather and drain it into their <coughs> recharge areas. With high mountains that have a snowpack, the feet of water into the recharge zone is stretched out into the drier months. This map shows the catch basins that recharge the aquifer. The smaller gray area is the basin tied directly to aquifer recharge, while the green area uh, larger is the basin that supplies only part of its water through leakage of Lake Pend Oreille into the aquifer at its southern end. Maybe the last ounce of water you drank came from Canada. Step nine, let's stir up the dish 20, with 21 purveyors, large and small, all in business to, of supplying water to their customers and tapping the aquifer with 122 wells and a pumping system to deliver the product to the customers. Notice that Spokane, the block in purple, is by far the largest. One major customer is not shown on this map, which is the Spokane River which can also receive aquifer water during certain, in certain reaches of the river during certain parts of the year. Uh, Downriver water customers with water rights want to assure their share. There's also an obligation to support native species that depend on water levels in the river. So a toast to our water resources that have served us well for over a hundred years, and will be quenching our thirst for many generations to come. There's nothing better to toast with than a cool glass of water. That our fine aquifer product, our natural mineral resource. And in the words of aqueduct, don't pollute the aquifer, it's beneath you, quack.